Okay, good morning. Um, this is the lineup for today. I, hope, I think you'll find it interesting. We're going to continue talking about the weapons of World War I. And there's also, can you hear me? I hope so. Um, we're going to talk about the, continue to talk about the weapons of World War I, and there's going to be a brief um, sort of documentary uh, that goes along with three of them. The same fellow that we heard talking about uh, poison gas, he's going to speak a bit about airplanes, tanks, and submarines. And then um, at the end, I wanted to just mention a couple of points that I think might be of interest um, related to World War I, not necessarily to this topic but uh, just you know, sort of um, side uh, factoids, interesting little um, connections locally to World War I that maybe we weren't aware of. And um, so that's how I'd like to finish off. The next time we'll probably just finish. Question? Uh, the next time I'll probably just um, finish off maybe with um, the last aspects of the weapons to go on to the Russian Revolution and um, what happened on the Eastern Front uh, during World War I. We'll start actually with the um, major, a couple of major battles on the Eastern Front in Russia in World War I, but what's really interesting is um, the overthrow of the Tsar, the end of the reign of the Romanovs and the Russian Revolution that brought communism first to Russia and then to Eastern Europe. And um, that all comes out of World War I as well. So uh, that's what we'll be going the next time. But this time I want to um, continue on a bit with uh, our discussion of the weapons and related issues of World War I. On your screen, uh, you'll see a picture of, we spoke about this the last time, an Pickelhalbe. So a Pickelhalbe in German is a pickle bonnet. But that thing on the top, that protrusion, is a spike. And as I mentioned the last time, in previous wars, the German soldiers wore these things. And um, because in previous wars, we didn't have trenches and no man's land. Uh, it was pretty much mano a mano and everyone up close to each other, no, no distancing there. And so you could just bend, uh, bend your head down and gore the person in front of you with that protrusion sticking out of the top. That was wor before World War I. Um, that uh, helmet didn't see uh, use in German wars ever since then, uh, since before World War I. Then um, World War I rolled along and um, the various sides had to produce, as I said, helmets because it was a defensive mechanism against projectiles and other explosives that could cause serious damage. Uh, brain damage to the soldiers. So the Germans quickly moved on from the Pickelhalbe, which was known, and it's spelled wrong here, Stahlhelm, that should be an A, not an E. Stahlhelm in German means a steel helmet. And um, obviously it's missing the pickle on the halbe, right? It doesn't have that, that uh, spike anymore, S-T-E-A. Um, but it was a very necessary a, no. development because, as we mentioned previously, let me just fix this up, the um, notion of trench warfare, and again, all of these new weapons that were landing here and there um, could be deleterious, could be very dangerous. So the Germans came up with the steel helmet, known as the Stahlhelm, um, and that replaced the Pickelhalbe. But um, this is not just a German uh, phenomenon during World War I. The other armies had to also produce their um, steel helmets of varying types. Um, and the first really do it were the, were the French. Try to find a French one here. Um, this is, yes, here we are. This is a French helmet of World War I. And uh, in the beginning of the war, the French didn't have this. Neither did the British. Um, what they had was cloth, as I mentioned earlier, cloth uh, headwear. 
which obviously was not uh, sufficient to protect their soldiers. So the French came up with this steel helmet. But these steel helmets only really came about in the second year of the war, um, in 1915. Makes sense. After all, the entrenchment, the digging of the trenches, the trench warfare that ensued um, began in the fall, really, of 1914, but it became clear it was not going to end anytime soon. And therefore, um, necessity is the mother of invention, as they say. And when it became clear that this was going to be a long-term affair with people dug in and with all of these dangerous uh, elements out there, something had to be done to protect soldiers. And the French came up with this steel helmet. This was in 1915, in the second year of the war. Same was true of the British. The British developed their own uh, steel helmets. Um, the British didn't um, care for the French design. So here, here you see the British helmet design. And um, looks like a soup up the, upside down soup bowl, really. Um, actually, I don't know if you can see it. On my desk, I have uh, this um, British World War I uh, machine gun soldier, and you can see the same helmet on the top of his head. Okay, so the British modified the, the French model. The British model is flatter, obviously, and uh, probably more comfortable in a sense, because the, well, they all had that strap at the bottom, obviously, to hold it on. Eventually, the Americans entered the war, and here's an American World War I helmet, okay, set up a cross between the French and, and the British models. So the helmet was an important development. It's not a weapon per se, but it is a, um, a necessary component of the uniform that um, takes into account all of the potential dangers um, connected with the weapons that were introduced um, at the time. So that, I mentioned also the last time that there was the introduction of um, khaki uh, uniforms rather than bright red or blue uh, to protect the soldiers from oncoming detection, fire and detection. You know, um, this way at least they would blend in more with the landscape and um, make it uh, a bit easier to avoid enemy fire. Another interesting development in World War I was mining. I sort of alluded to it as well. Um, mining came about, first of all, because of developments in technology, but also because of the nature of the landscape. Um, the dry chalk of the ground at the Battle of the Somme and the other um, uh, types of soil to be found on the battlefields of Belgium made it easier for um, mining companies to dig out underneath, to um, excavate underneath the surface. And what that provided for these armies was the opportunity to burrow into the earth under no man's land, that strip of land between one enemy trench line and the other. And in creating these underground tunnels, so tunneling or sapping, um, they were able to load these tunnels up with explosives and then blow up uh, either if they could get under the enemy trench, actually blow up the trench, or close enough to blow up the trench because of the reverberations of the earth. And um, of course, there were dangers involved. Um, you had to be careful that the earth on top of you didn't collapse, but this was a very potent and very dangerous um, new form of warfare, which resulted in not only um, multiple, multiple, you know, numerous deaths, but also in the cratering of the earth. And if you have cratered earth in no man's land, it made it very difficult to negotiate that land. And then it was hard for both sides really to get through uh, towards the other side, the other trench line. So very often after an underground explosion like this, they would, the troops would come out to try and level the land again and fill it in so that they could um, transverse that, um, crater that was um, left in the middle of no man's land. And a lot of the artwork that we're going to see later on uh, in the semester, um, there's a very large number of 
um, either um, etchings or even oil paintings, where you see the cratered earth, where it's torn up with huge, it's like the surface of the moon, you know, these huge holes from these explosives and um, remainders of trees, just, you know, sometimes a stump or part of a tree with one or two branches, everything else blown away. And it's a very powerful image of the destructive force of World War I. Um, and these uh, underground explosives, the mining that was um, used during the war was, again, a new development, but also together with the images of trench warfare create a total picture of destruction and, and, and ruin and, and basically, you know, totally obliterating um, what used to be the face of the earth, you know, the visions and the, you know, the edifices and the, you know, the landscapes that before the war were known to everyone and were in many instances standing for many, many centuries now totally uh, blown away and or unrecognizable as a result of these new um, and highly you know, the deadly um, components. Um, communications is a very important aspect as well. Um, obviously, generals were always far behind the troops and far behind the trenches, had to communicate with their troops in the front lines, tell them where to go and what to do. So um, very, um, at least for the time, sophisticated communication systems were set up as well. And very often um, they were located in basically in trenches, but all the way in the back behind the first, second, or third trench line. And um, these are much more, um, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot more room in them, you know, a lot more accommodating. Um, obviously, because these were senior officials who were placed there and because they had to have sufficient room and um, space to set up the various communication systems that allowed them to be in touch with, with um, their forward troops. Interestingly, on the Eastern Front, the Russians were not that sophisticated and their communications systems very often broke down or were intercepted by Germans. And so the Germans knew exactly at various points what the Russians were gonna do because they didn't have a particularly sophisticated um, system of uh, communicating with their troops um, in the front lines. Now, we spoke about poison gas, we saw that um, piece on um, the impact of poison gas in the war, very important and deadly development. There are three weapons in World War I that I want to speak about now, and, and you'll see that brief documentary along with it, um, that each in its own way not only impacted greatly on the First World War, but had sustained impact and input into the Second World War and even moving forward beyond the Second World War. And the first one that I want to talk about is the tank. Tank um, emerged in World War I. And uh, if you're a fan of World War II war movies, you know the tanks were all over the place in World War II. And even in modern times, in more recent times, um, in certain landscapes, tanks still play an important role in the desert wars and so on. Tanks lumber across large expanses of desert as they go th also go through uh, heavy forest terrain. And um, so the tank was a very important part of this first really modern war. And here you have a picture of um, one World War I tank and you can see it's a pretty lumbering kind of a thing. And you'll notice uh, that the, uh, the um, weapon itself is sticking out of the side of the tank, that is say the, um, the gun. And um, in more modern tanks, obviously we've seen World War II movies and other uh, situations where tanks appear in warfare and they're now embedded on the top of the tank, uh, sticking out, um, directly at the enemy side. But this is a very early uh, World War I tank, but it's also an improved World War I tank because you'll note 
that there are um, the caterp caterpillar treads, as they're known, that move the tank forward. Previously, in the very first version of the tank, um, they had wheels, and the wheels were totally ineffective, um, especially when you're talking about the terrain of northwestern Europe. All of the, you know, uh, first of all, we talked about the, the land that had been destroyed and, you know, the cavernous um, uh, uh, pits from explosions, but also it's heavily forested. If you look behind this tank, you can see there's a, you know, a whole clump of um, very significant uh, tree, trees there. And that's too, true of, Euro of Europe in general, and certainly Northern Europe, where you have these very thick and dense forests. But a tank, because of these treads and its ability to move and to be mobile, although slowly, but uh, consistently is able to just mow down these trees, just like it would go through and mow down the barbed wire protections in front of the trenches in World War I. Um, they're heavy, they're metal, and so on. But as I said, they weren't always that um, uh, useful, and um, they went through many different designs before they finally uh, became viable uh, means of, uh, of war. So the tank was first introduced by the British Army, and it was a means of attacking trenches, basically. And um, it was also protected from small arms fire because the person inside, you know, maneuvering the tank was protected by this heavy steel, by steel armor around the tank. And they were first deployed in World War I in 1916 at the Battle of the Somme, S-O-M-M-E, also in France. There were very limited numbers of them, but it was that was the point when they first made their appearance during the war. At the first Battle of Cambrai, which is an important battle in 1917, we had the new and approved tanks, and um, they were able to provide more shell fire through the projectile, through the, the gun in front of the tank. And um, by the end of the war, the tank became a very significant part of British Army operations, as it did in the uh, armies of the other Western nations uh, and Eastern nations as well, Russians as well. But it was set a set of process of improvement along the way because they didn't always uh, operate well. They collapsed, they broke down, they were not particularly you know, pleasant to be in. You can imagine there's not a lot of air circulation in the early models and it was difficult for those gunners who were in the tank. Basically, what happened was um, Winston Churchill decided that the tank was going to be a very significant and a very important part of warfare. And the, um, he petitioned the then Prime Minister, H.H. H. Asquith, to further develop, further develop tanks um, for military service. But there was a reticence. There was not a lot of excitement um, on the part of Asquith and others to do it. And the tank um, at the time, I guess, wasn't considered to be a major uh, weapon, but Churchill was a very um, foresighted individual in many, many ways and insisted that the army doesn't take up the, uh, the cause of developing a more powerful and efficient tank than the Navy will because he was the first Lord of the Admiralty the British Navy. And indeed, he put together a commission, and the commission was charged with further enhancing uh, the usefulness and uh, the um, effectiveness of the tank. And indeed, that's how the tank became this major, um, this major component in warfare. By the way, why was it called a tank? Because originally the, um, the um, design was such that it looked like a big water tank. And um, it was not originally as the WC, uh, but they had to change the name because the WC in European parlance, at least, uh, well, most of Europe, but certainly in England, stands for water closet, you know, the bathroom. So it became known as the tank. It was like a water tank. And um, so what I'd like to do now is show you this brief, um, introduction or history of the development of the tank and its use in World War I, and then we're gonna go back to aircraft and submarines and so on. 
there are many weapons and technologies that one associates with modern warfare, but the biggest symbol of war of the past 100 years is unquestionably the tank, which was developed during the First World War and basically used everywhere since then. And today, I'm going to talk about tank development during World War I. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to a Great War special episode about tank development in the First World War. The concept of a new mighty armored vehicle had been floated within months of the war breaking out. The Western Front was already a stalemate, and the British were impressed enough by German barbed wire and machine gun defenses to want to create some sort of a machine gun destroyer. Armored cars and trains were nothing new, and combined mobility and safety, and most armies used them to some degree. But the problem was to come up with something to use on the broken, blasted ground, the deep trenches and the barbed wire of the Western Front. Years before the war, though, the caterpillar tracks of companies like Holtz that made farm machinery were already used in gasoline-powered tractors that could cross terrain impassable for wheeled vehicles. So the technology was already there. Ernest Swinton, official war correspondent on the Western Front and also an officer in the British Army, wrote of the need for new machines. And by June 1915, his ideas were being discussed in the Landship Committee, established by Winston Churchill and Eustace Dane Corps. But they weren't really talking about anything more than an armored Trojan horse that could transport many soldiers behind the lines at this point. The Invention Committee, on the other hand, came up with specific demands for a new vehicle. It has to have a top speed of no less than four miles per hour. It must be able to climb a five-foot parapet and cross an eight-foot gap. It should be able to reverse. And it wasn't merely enough to cross no man's land. It should be able to fight as well. Many bureaucrats and politicians were skeptical, but a prototype, Little Willie, was built by the Foster Works, though its 105 horsepower Daimler engine was barely powerful enough to move the 16-ton machine. Also, its treads were too narrow to cross the gaps required. Swinton and his staff began sketching new designs. Big Willie was able to meet demands at 30 tons with 10 millimeter frontal armor, eight millimeter side armor, and two 57 millimeter guns. This tank, a name Swinton gave it, but known as Mother, was ready for inspection in January 1916. It was built in secrecy, partly to prevent the Germans from getting wind of it, but also to keep the details and test results from the politicians or men of the War Department who could possibly interfere with the project. For that reason, its official premiere was not in front of frontline officers, but men like Lloyd George or Herbert Kitchener, who were high up in the government. Big Willie surprised the skeptics, but disappointed those who thought it was going to be a miracle weapon. It was slow, and it was vulnerable to artillery. But Sweden had not envisaged tanks to act on their own, but to support infantry, even carrying wireless sets and laying telephone cables. British High Command ordered 150 of what would be known as the Mark I tank. It's not really clear just how much the French knew of these developments, but around the same time that Big Willie went into production as the Mark I, the French were working on their own designs. Their first test was a four-ton armored vehicle for wire cutting. It had some success, but didn't make more than a few tests. A Fritz tractor was converted into a machine gun carrier in 1915, but its tests were disappointing. Soon though, Colonel, later General, Jean-Baptiste Estienne proposed an idea using Holt Caterpillar treads like the British and the skills of the Schneider Clouseau factory. By early 1916, a design had been created and in February, 400 were ordered, but they weren't really ready until 1917. The Schneider, when it went into action, didn't have thick enough armor to handle the armor-piercing German SNK rounds. It was soon followed by the Saint-Chamont, but its tracks were too narrow to carry it over the mud of the Western Front and it frequently got stuck. Both models were also really cumbersome, so SPN ordered new tanks from Renault, which were the first tanks with a turret that could rotate 360 degrees and are really the first modern tanks. But back to the British for a minute. 
They wanted their tanks ready by a summer offensive in 1916. The men recruited to operate them were trained in gunnery and driving, but there were no field tests under fire, of course, so tank tactics were, at best, rudimentary. But the first 50 British Mark I tanks landed in France August 30th, 1916. On the way to the front, they constantly stopped to demonstrate their abilities, which put stress on both men and machines. So by the time they arrived at the front on September 13th, many of them had already broken down. Still, the new tank weapon first saw action September 15th, 1916 at the Somme. And even from the first few battles, you could tell how effective they would become, in spite of their many shortcomings and malfunctions. Now, I'm not going to talk about individual tank battles today, since I'll be covering them in the regular episodes as we reach them. The Germans would eventually develop tanks of their own in response to the British success with their tanks. The A7B Sturm Panzerwagen was first produced in 1917, but only 20 were ever fully fitted and deployed, as they used a lot of resources, required a crew of 18, and were built by hand. In fact, it was more efficient for the Germans to capture and refit British Mark IV tanks, which they would then send back into action as Beutepanzer. But the A7B was well-armored and durable, though its off-road performance left a lot to be desired because of low ground clearance and general shape. And they had many mechanical problems as well. The British Mark IV had minor improvements on the Mark I, had a crew of eight and came in male and female versions. The male had two six-pounder cannons and three 303 Lewis guns, while the females just had five of the Lewis guns as weapons. The females would prove ineffective against the A7Bs during the first ever tank-on-tank -tank battle at villiers Brantonu in 1918, though the male would do well there. One drawback with the Mark IV was that it was slower than the A7B, with a top speed of four miles per hour. The A7B could hit nine on a road. The French built the Renault FT-17 light tank, which was pretty revolutionary in overcoming the problems of weight and maneuverability, and as I said, had a rotating turret. It wasn't especially fast, but it had reasonable protection and fairly good firepower. It also only needed a crew of two to operate it. It was the first tank to be really mass-produced and first saw combat in 1918. Now, they would be used by various nations around the world until after World War II. So there you have a brief rundown of the beginnings of the tank, the weapon that would be the symbol for much of the wars of the 20th century. We could have talked about it for hours, and I encourage you all to look it up yourself to get a better idea of how things like Swinton's designs became reality, and how that reality became the efficient mobile fortresses that we think of when we think of the tank. We'll probably talk about tank tactics and other notable prototypes and the individual tanks a bit more in the future. We'd like to thank the Przemysl Fortress Museum for letting us shoot here. It's a really interesting museum, and if you happen to be in Przemysl in Poland, you should definitely check it out. And if you'd like to learn more about a weapon that really came into its own during the First World War, you can click here to see our special about submarines. Do not forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Okay. Okay. So, um, pretty good introduction to the tank and the development and the um, uh, modifications of the tank, which became a, clearly a major uh, aspect of warfare in, in, in the modern in the modern world, and continues to a certain degree to be uh, an important part of waging war even to this very day. Now. Um, mentioned aircraft. We're going to see his piece on aircraft. I want to say something a bit about um, air warfare in World War I. And there is a very good <clears throat> two-part documentary DVD called Warbirds Over the Trenches. It's very long, so I can't show it. I mean, altogether it's over three hours, but I will attempt somehow or other to post it so that if you're interested, you can you can look at it. And um, the use of airplanes, also very interesting, and air power, very interesting part of World War I and obviously moving forward. <clears throat> now, airplanes, of course, are relatively new 
And, um, you know, in 1914, uh, they weren't particularly widespread. Uh, mostly, in fact, they were used for recreational purposes in America. After all, the first airplane was the work of the Wright brothers. And um, it had limited usage because of its nature and, and, and the way it was constructed. And the w wings at the time were obviously made from materials that were not very strong and they were also highly flammable. So in the context of a war, you could see where it'd be a danger. Um, any sort of a spark or any sort of a, a projectile could suddenly set off a major fire and uh, the plane would go crashing to the ground, which by the way happened more times than not. I mean, it, it was not an unusual phenomenon. By the way, the United States, for example, we entered the war in 1917. We didn't have a, a Department of Air Force. We didn't have an Air Force. Uh, the Air Force, to the extent it existed, was part of the Navy. And the reason it was part of the Navy is because at that point, aircraft being so new and um, uh, really unique that um, there weren't facilities even, there were no airports. So how did the aircraft uh, managed to get off the ground, they were launched from boats. So that the, in the beginning, the Air Force really part of the Navy uh, until it became its own separate um, military entity. But uh, these aircraft would fly off the, the you know, the, um, the top of the, let's say, aircraft carrier or some large battleship. And that's how it was basically launched into the air. Um, Later on, of course, as aircraft became much more important and significant, the separate Air Force Department was uh, established, and of course, all the facilities necessary for the production and for the uh, for the use of aircraft became um, much more significant, and um, therefore, a major part of the military structure of the United States: the Navy, Air Force, Army, and so on. Each one representing a different aspect of warfare. The Air Force, obviously, the air war, the Navy on the seas, the naval war, and the Army the land troops, and so on. Now, we saw in the um, piece about the tanks that uh, as they were modified and improved, the, they developed a revolving turret on the top of the tank, and that's where the gun stuck out. And so it was able to uh, be focused on the enemy or enemy concentrations and it would move around if we moved around too. Um, obviously that made it that much more important and significant a player and that much more deadly. The aircraft um, in the beginning didn't have the possibility or the capability of actually um, firing on enemy. Uh, on the enemy. The truth is that the aircraft couldn't even really achieve altitudes of significance. They were pretty low flying. So in the beginning, aircraft had only one purpose, and that was reconnaissance. So the airplane would be used, low flying aircraft, to obtain a view of the concentration of the enemy troops, of the movement of the enemy troops, and the location of uh, tr uh, trench lines and so on. So it had a very, very limited ability. But as the war progressed, it became much more significant. And most important was the ability to use aircraft as another means of firing on enemy troops. And so the guns would have to obviously stick out of the front part of the craft and then fire down or across towards enemy lines. But there's a problem. Because you'll note, if you see this picture in front of you, that early aircraft had propellers, right? And propellers are, you know, metal, um, um, metal pieces that revolve, revolving uh, metal uh, slabs. And obviously, uh, if you're off, even remotely, in your, in your firing, the bullet or whatever would bounce off the metal of the propeller and just ricochet back towards the one who's doing the firing. Not a very effective or a safe way of doing things. So there had to be a means of uh, calculating 
exactly at which point the projectile or the bullet or whatever would go between the blades of the of the rotating um, propeller and avoid that ricochet effect. And so that became an important development in World War I, which of course made the airplane much more um, viable, much more significant in terms of um, an offensive weapon, not just as a means of uh, surveying, surveying the land below. And that, that design uh, was the, produced by a gentleman by the name of Reinhold Klotz at the Fokker Flugzeugwerke, uh, the Fokker uh, Airplane Works. Uh, and so the plane became known as the Fokker, F-O-K-K-E-R. And um, you'll hear about that uh, in this next segment. In addition to airplanes in World War I, there were other aircraft. The Zeppelin was a very important, basically it was an air machine big blimp-like thing. The Zeppelin actually played a major role in uh, the First World War in Africa. Uh, the Germans sent Zeppelins into Africa with, uh, with their huge, they were like, uh, huge cargo vehicles, and they could send not only soldiers, but huge amounts of material, uh, weapons and so on, um, in the body of the Zeppelins. The Zeppelins had their own problems, because they were air machines and easily you know, ignited under certain circumstances. I guess everyone's familiar with the unfortunate story in Lakehurst, New Jersey, during World War, I guess, World War II was it, that the Graf Zeppelin exploded uh, over New Jersey and came crashing down in you know, fiery, uh, fiery flames and so on um, because they made a colossal error. Um, it was being used actually as a passenger conveyance. Um, it was like a big moving, it was like the air, Bound version of a luxury liner on the sea. And on each table, they had um, gas lamps, so to produce light and so on. Problem is, you really don't want to have a gas lamp in a dirigible, in a Zeppelin, and you know, basically a, um, a huge flying, uh, almost air balloon, um, when it's so easy, so combustible, and easy, easily ignitable, and of course it blew up. So you don't hear much these days about um, Zeppelins, but in World War I, they were yet another means of um, pursuing the war and also providing also um, reconnaissance of um, troop movements down below, but also since they were large, bulk, you know, like huge uh, blimp-like things, uh, they were able to transport men and materiel not all that quickly, but um, certainly uh, effectively. And um, as I said, in the war in Africa, World War I in Africa, where the Germans were fighting the British and the, and the French, each country had its colonies in Africa. The Germans had German Southwest Africa and German East Africa. Um, so the Germans wanted to protect, obviously, their colonial holdings on the continent, and therefore they pursued a war against the Allies. One of the other reasons, by the way, they pursued the war against the Allies is to keep them occupied um, in a basically meaningless war in Africa and drain some of their troops and machinery from the war on the Western Front, which was dragging on. So it's also a way of, you know, sort of diverting um, the French and British um, war effort. Uh, in the end, the, of course, the Germans uh, lost and lost their colonies in Africa. But it's a very, very interesting story with a very, very interesting German general um, uh, who was one of the rare instances of how um, actually a German military figure was a great humanitarian. So much so that when the Germans now had to pull out of Africa at the end of the war, huge numbers of natives wanted to go back to Germany with him because of the way, he, the way he treated them and the respect he showed for them, which was highly unusual uh, at the time. And um, later on, he's an interesting fellow, and uh, on the list of term paper topics, that's one of the topics, and it's really quite interesting if you want to pursue it. Um, he was then offered a position in the German army in World War II, which he refused uh, because of the nature of Germany in World War II, what was going on, and he wanted no part of 
you know, the atrocities and, and the genocide of the war. Unfortunately, he did lose his two sons in uh, World War II. They were uh, killed in action. But um, a very, very interesting story in its own right. So I'd like now to show you the piece on World War I airplanes and aircraft. And uh, then from there, we'll move on to submarines. When the world went to war in 1914, the Wright brothers had made the world's first powered flight only a decade earlier, and the airplane was still in its infancy. But the remarkable advances made in aviation during World War I are still the core of air power today. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to a Great War special episode about the war in the air. Now, to say the first planes used in the war were basic is an understatement. Cockpits were open, and instruments were rudimentary. There were no navigational aids, and pilots had to rely on whatever maps could be found, which might even be a school atlas or a road map. Getting lost was commonplace, and landing in a field to ask directions was not unusual, as was flying low alongside railway lines, hoping to read station names on the platform. But throughout the war, there was an upward spiral of technological developments, as first one side and then the other gained the advantage, and ever more effective aircraft replaced the basic machines that took to the skies in 1914. The first airplanes were not seen as offensive weapons, but as scouts. Even at the end of the war, the fighter types, such as the Sopwith Snipe and Fokker D-8, were still classified as scouts. Men on horseback were used traditionally to scout out the enemy's position, but they had obvious limitations. While the scout planes had a greater freedom of movement, a much wider range of operation, and the unparalleled speed to accomplish these missions. And aerial photography became a vital operation for both sides during the war. This was a continuation of the successful use in earlier conflicts of tethered, lighter-than-air balloons for reconnaissance, such as those used in the American Civil War. But Flying reconnaissance missions was dangerous. The pilot was required to fly straight and level to allow the observer to take a series of overlapping photographs. And there was no better target for anti-aircraft guns or stalking fighters. And long range reconnaissance meant flying well behind the front lines. Perhaps the best reconnaissance plane of the war was the Italian Ansaldo SVA-5. This plane, produced in both single-seater and two-seater variants, had a range and altitude allowing it to cross the Alps. And with a top speed of 230 kilometers per hour, it could fly fast enough to outrun enemy fighters. And here's a little side note. It was more important, if less romantic, for a fighter pilot to shoot down an observation plane than to shoot down another fighter. More than half of Manfred von Richthofen's record-setting 80 victories were scored against reconnaissance and observation planes. When war broke out, the number of aircraft in use was tiny. France, for example, had fewer than 140 aircraft at the start of the war. By the end of the war, she fielded 4,500 aircraft, more than any other protagonist. This may not seem like too much, but it doesn't give the true indication of the amount of aircraft involved. During the war, France produced no less than 68,000 aircraft. 52,000 of them were lost in battle for a loss rate of 77%. The period between 1914 and 1918 saw not only tremendous production, but also tremendous development in aircraft technology. A typical British aircraft at the outbreak of the war was the general purpose BE-2C, with a top speed of 116 kilometers per hour. Powered by a 90 horsepower engine, it could remain aloft for over three hours. Three years later, the SE-5A fighter was powered by a 200 horsepower engine and had a top speed of 222 kilometers per hour nearly twice as fast. Britain's most famous bomber, the Handley Page 0400, could carry a bomb load of 900 kilograms at a top speed of 156 kilometers per hour for flights lasting eight hours. It was powered by two 360 horsepower engines. In 1914, it was important that aircraft be easy to fly, as the amount of training the pilots received was minimal, to say the least. Some pilots began flying combat missions 
having completed only three and a half hours of actual flying time. For this reason, aircraft were designed for stability. But by the end of the war, stability had given way to maneuverability. The famous Sopwith Camel was, for example, a difficult aircraft to fly, but supremely agile. Many earlier common technologies became obsolete as the war progressed. Like, a lot of the aircraft in 1914 were of pusher layout. This is the same configuration that the Wright brothers used, where the propeller faced backwards and pushed the aircraft forward. The alternative layout, where the propeller faces forwards and pulls the aircraft, was called a tractor design. It provided better performance, but in 1914, visibility was deemed more important than speed. World War I marked the end of pusher aircraft. Now, as early as 1912, designers at the British firm Vickers were experimenting with machine gun carrying aircraft. The first concrete result was the Vickers Experimental Fighting Biplane 1. This was a pusher type of plane. This provided an optimal machine gun position from which the gun could be fired directly forward without an obstructing propeller, and also reloaded and cleared in flight. An important drawback was that pusher designs had inferior performance to tractor types. They were simply too slow to catch their quarry. So there was an obvious need for some means to fire a machine gun forward from a tractor aircraft. It would seem most natural to place the gun between the pilot and the propeller, firing in the direct line of flight, so the gun could be aimed by aiming the aircraft. It was also important that the breach of the weapon be readily accessible to the pilot so that he could clear the jams and stoppages to which early machine guns were prone. However, this presented an obvious problem. A percentage of bullets fired free through a revolving propeller will strike the blades with predictable results. The Moraine Salnia Company designed a system of deflector blades, metal wedges on the propeller. Roland Garros tried out this system in April 1915. He managed to score several kills before being forced by engine failure, possibly caused by the repeated strain on his aircraft's crankshaft from the deflected bullets, to land behind enemy lines, where he and his plane were captured. The German high command passed Garros' captured plane to the Fokker Company with orders to copy the design. The deflector system, though, was totally unsuitable for the steel-jacketed German ammunition, so the Fokker engineers finally came up with a machine gun that was synchronized with the propeller by using interrupter gear. They produced the Eindecker series of planes, and crude as these little monoplanes were, they gave a period of German air superiority, known as the Fokker Scourge by the Allies. The psychological effect exceeded the material. The Allies had up to now been more or less unchallenged in the air, and the vulnerability of their older reconnaissance aircraft, especially the British BE-2 and French Farman pushers, came as a very nasty shock. Everybody knows about flying aces, right? The dashing and daring heroes of their homeland. Here are the greatest aces of the war. Manfred von Richthofen, German, 80 victories, also known as the Red Baron. Ernst Udet, German, 62 victories, also famous for using a parachute to survive being shot down. Mick Manick, British, 73 victories, the most victories of any British ace, although some of his kills are now disputed, in which case that honor falls to Billy Bishop, Canadian ace, 72 victories, and René Fonck, French, 75 victories, the most victories of any Allied ace. So there you have it, a brief introduction to the war in the air. It was during this period that the key tasks that aircraft could perform were experimented with and refined observation and reconnaissance, tactical and strategic bombing, ground attack, naval warfare, and with the growing importance and influence of aircraft came the need to control the air, and thus the fighter was born. Brigadier General Billy Mitchell put it very well, quote, the day has passed when armies on the ground or navies on the sea can be the arbiter of a nation's destiny in war. The main power of defense and the power of initiative against an enemy has passed to the air, end quote. We will, of course, do future specials on flying aces and the actual planes used in combat. And also, we'll have features and links about aircraft of the war on our Facebook page. You can also see our bio special on the Red Baron right here. See you Thursday with our regular episode. Okay, so why don't you talk about yet one more
aspect of weaponry, and that is the submarine. Submarine plays a very important role in World War I, not just strategically or militarily, but also politically, because but for the German use of the U-boat, as is known in English, as Unterseeboot in German, the undersea boat, a submarine, or the U-boat, as it's known, but for the use of the, or unrestricted use of the submarine by Germans, and we'll talk more about that, but that really pushed America over the, over the line, and um, together with a num number of other incidents um, that the Germans engaged in, uh, forced the United States finally to declare war against Germany in 1917. Um, the submarine was a uniquely German phenomenon, really, uh, during World War I. And um, it was uh, based on new propulsion systems that had emerged, uh, new means of um, using diesel power, diesel power and battery power and so on, that would allow a vessel, a seagoing vessel, to operate under the surface of the, of the ocean and therefore inflict incredible damage because for the most part until other systems of detection were were uh were come up with there was no way to tell where the boat was and um therefore it, it you know it's unleashed incredible uh, terror on the high seas later on it led by the way to all sorts of international law and covenants regarding uh the use of uh, these sorts of weapons um, inter that interfered with the free passage of um, passenger ships and commercial vessels and so on, because the Germans were blowing everything out of the water and also blocking um, the various ports, which is a real problem for the British. They were dependent on their ports to supply the food and other needs of the population. And now these ports were not viable, couldn't be used because of the danger of being blown out of the water as they approached by German submarines. Also, Germans were, uh, were um, laying uh, bombs, uh, underwater bombs and so on, and other traps that would blow up commercial vessels. So the um, use of the submarine was a major uh, development and a major aspect of warfare in the First World War, and also the cause of uh, great concern uh, by the British, in particular with respect to uh, the supply lines coming in, but also uh, we're going to talk at some point when we discuss the U.S. entry into the war, a very unfortunate event in 1915 when a very large and very uh, 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 elegant and um, top-of-the-line uh, British um, passenger ship the Lusitania was blown out of the water by German U-boats. It's an interesting story, we'll talk about it, and a bit of controversy around it, whether it was really a surprise attack or it wasn't or whatever. But the point is that 1,200 or so innocent civilians lost their lives on the Lusitania. And um, that was one of the events that led to the progressive anger of the United States government and the general population against Germany. And ultimately, um, when the Germans refused to cease and desist from using unrestricted submarine warfare, the um, United States declared war in April of 1917. So the Germans were fully aware of the fact that they were posing this great threat. And um, in fact, uh, Lieutenant Otto Wedigen, one of the uh, uh, individuals who was uh, charged with um, uh, manning the um, U-boat uh, wrote the following. He said, how much they feared our submarines and how wide was the agitation caused by good little U-9, that's one of the early U-boats, is shown by the English reports that a whole flotilla of German submarines had attacked the cruisers and that this flotilla had approached under cover of the flag of Holland. These reports were absolutely untrue. The U-9 was the only submarine on deck and she flew the flag, she still flies the German naval ensign. Uh, 
right? So the um, British told their subjects that actually um, the reason the submarines were successful in blowing up a whole flotilla was because they were misleading in that they were flying the flag of Holland, which is a neutral country, rather than the flag of Germany, which was a belligerent country, obviously one of the central powers, um, which he says not true. Everyone knew what the flag was. It was a German flag. And the Germans knew that they had tremendous um, power to instill fear and apprehension in the world because now um, the passage, free passage of both passenger liners and commercial vehicles that were not belligerent, they weren't involved in the war, they were delivering goods and food and so on, would now be concerned about the possibility of attack from an unseen source. The submarines, of course, were underground. And, um, and so the struggle between the German submarines and the British countermeasures that they took became known as the First Battle of the Atlantic. And uh, the Germans kept producing more submarines and um, uh, they became more effective, obviously, as time went on. The British sought all sorts of ways to counteract submarine attacks with early detection and so on, but they were a major source of um, destruction, both of civilian vessels and of um, military vessels. Remember, from the beginning, I hope, of the course we talked about the different causes that ultimately led to World War I and the different tensions uh, between the European nations. One of them had to do with the arms race. And remember that the Germans had a particular, I should say the Germans, the Kaiser, the emperor, had a particular fondness for developing a great navy, a great uh, uh, naval force, in part because he was, remember, the grandson of Queen Victoria of England and he spent his summers uh, watching the British uh, in their yacht races and participating with his big long personal yacht, the Hohenzollern, but he also saw the, the British naval maneuvers and um, was determined to not only match but surpass the, the British military capabilities and part of that was the development of the submarine um, and its deadly effect uh, during the First World War. So I want to see you to see now a brief uh, talk on submarine warfare. And then when we get back, I'd like to finish off with something I think is of interest. Last one, next one, no, no, second. No. The two most common reasons people go to see plastic surgeons are undoubtedly wrinkles and The war is going to be won by inventions. Thus said British first sea lord Jackie Fisher in 1915, and he may well have been right. The development of radio, interrupter gear, the tank, the huge advances in airplane technology and artillery, mustard gas, all played a part, and the list goes on. But one development has to go right near the top of the list, the submarine. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to a Great War special episode about the development of the submarine before World War I. Yes, before. A lot of the exploits of submarines are covered in our regular weekly episodes. So today, I'll talk about what came before. Submarines had existed in some form or another for centuries, but until the First World War, they were pretty much a hit and miss thing. Now, contrary to what most might assume, it was Germany who was most hesitant about building a submarine fleet for most of the years leading up to the war, and Britain that was the world leader in subs. German Grand Admiral Tirpitz had this to say in 1904. The submarine is of no great value in war at sea. We have no money to waste on experimental vessels. His British opposite, Jackie Fisher, who I quoted before, had this to say the same year. 
the very best among us fail to realize the vast impending revolution in naval warfare and naval strategy that the submarine will accomplish. What actually changed the German plans was Kaiser Wilhelm himself. He took a ride in a submarine, one of the few monarchs to do so, and was so impressed that he overruled Tirpitz and ordered the development of a German U-boat fleet. It took a lot of time and effort for the sub to develop into what it was during the war, and many countries were involved in various ways and various developments. The man, arguably the most influential to submarine development, was the Irish engineer John Philip Holland. Holland tried to sell his first design to the US Navy, but they turned him down. So he returned to Ireland and convinced the Fenian Brotherhood to pay him to work full time on research and design. But the Fenians grew frustrated with his delays and eventually Holland literally stole his submarine and hid it in a shed in Connecticut where it remained for 35 years. Now, in case you're wondering, that sub is now on display in the Patterson City Museum in New Jersey. Anyhow, Holland continued to improve his designs and in 1897, launched the first sub that was capable of running for any real distance, and more importantly, the first that combined electric motors for undersea running and gasoline engines for surface use. Three years later, the US Navy bought and commissioned his prototype and ordered six more like it. The company that emerged from this was called the Electric Boat Company, which sounds like a crazy 60s band. And that company today is defense contractor General Dynamics, who make nuclear subs. Holland's design, combining the two motors, quickly became standard worldwide. One other thing, during the time it took for Holland to convince the Navy to buy it, Spanish-American war was fought. Holland offered to go to Cuba and sink the Spanish fleet if when he was successful, the Navy would buy his design. The Navy decided that sending a private citizen in a private warship to sink foreign ships was probably not a good idea. Speaking of sinking ships, torpedo development was also proceeding at the same time. In 1866, British engineer Robert Whitehead developed the Whitehead torpedo. It was supposed to be a harbor defense against attacking ships. It was powered by compressed air, and by the 1890s, these torpedoes could travel up to 56 kilometers per hour. By that time, a few people were experimenting with using torpedoes and subs together. In 1889, for example, Spaniard Isaac Peral's sub, Peral, successfully fired three whiteheads during a trial run. Keep in mind that there were not yet torpedo tubes. Torpedoes were launched from the sides of the sub. By the 20th century, torpedoes were a standard complement on many naval vessels, with launching tubes placed on the decks before eventually being built into more protected areas of the ship. Also by the 20th century, the submarine race was on. In 1900, Britain had five Hollands on order, and in 1904, they proved their capability. In their first maneuvers, when they were tasked with defending Portsmouth, they torpedoed four warships, much to everyone's surprise. Still though, even as the 19-teens dawned, general naval doctrine held that submarines were limited to harbor and coastal defensive operations. In 1912, when two British subs slipped into a fleet anchorage and torpedoed three ships, and British Navy staff warned that enemy subs might be a serious threat to the fleet, the British Navy board scoffed and refused to recognize them as anything other than defensive. That same year, the US Navy replaced the sub's gasoline engines with diesel. Diesel was more stable and far less flammable. The entire world followed suit. Just before the war broke out in June 1914, British Admiral Percy Scott, a big advocate of submarines, wrote, as the motor has driven the horse from the road, so has the submarine driven the battleship from the sea. Submarines and airplanes have entirely revolutionized naval warfare. He called for more submarines and no more battleships. He was loudly attacked by the government and senior naval officers that his theory was a fantastic dream. But you know, theories and dreams often have a way of becoming a reality. And three months later, when the war raged, the HMS Pathfinder became the first ship torpedoed by a sub using standard torpedo tubes. Two weeks after that, U-9 sank three British warships in an hour, and the age of the submarine as an offensive threat had truly begun. Submarines at this time did have some serious drawbacks, though. 
They still had limited underwater speed and endurance and were pretty much blind when submerged. So they needed to be in position before an attack. Also, their surface speed was less than the cruising speed of most warships. Radio technology at the time was severely limited. And when a sub used a radio to send, the enemy knew where they were. So they were only set to receive messages most often until contact with the enemy. Again, I'll talk about sub and tech development during the war in the regular episodes and other special. If you were wondering, at the beginning of World War I, the nation with the most subs was Great Britain, with 74 in service and 34 under construction. They were followed by France, Russia, the United States, and then Germany. Germany had 28 in service, 17 under construction at the time. As you are aware, Germany would beef up that number substantially, and German subs would sink 5,000 ships during the war, a total of 13 million tons of shipping. And the submarine would indeed change the face of warfare, become one of the symbols of modern war. Thank you, William E. Lutz, for helping us with the research for this episode. Now, if you want a general overview of the navies of World War I, Okay, um, good introduction and good background material. We'll talk more about submarine warfare as it um, affects the politics of the United States and the entry of the US into the war, ultimately. Wanted to finish off today with um, something a little different, but related, obviously, because um, I think you might find it interesting. Sometimes we see reminders or, or you know, certain allusions to, for example, World War I. You know, we're not really aware uh, that they're there, what they, what they really mean. Um, so I want to mention three. And it covers three different boroughs, right? We can start with the Bronx. You're all in Bronx, right? And I'm sure at some point or other, as you headed towards Lehman College, back in the good old days when we could head towards Lehman College, um, at some point, you probably crossed Jerome Avenue, and you might have asked, or maybe you never asked, who is it named for? So, we've already encountered the famous First Lord of the Admiralty in World War I, Sir Winston Churchill, who then became Prime Minister Winston Churchill in World War II. What's the connection? So, Winston Churchill um, was the son of Lord Randolph Churchill, a very significant figure in British politics, and he was the great, 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 whatever grandson of the, uh, of, um, uh, of the um, Lord Marlborough, very important figure going back in British history. But that was his father, Sir Randolph Churchill. Who is his mother, right? His mother was a woman by the name of Jenny Jerome, who was actually born in Brooklyn. And her father was, um, at various times, a very wealthy and successful stockbroker and businessman. Sometimes he wasn't so successful. But he owned a whole lot of real estate, and some of that real estate was in the Bronx. Hence, the long avenue known as Jerome Avenue and Jerome Avenue Reservoir are named for the father-in-law of Sir Winston Churchill. Right? So, a little unknown fact, but now we will look at, I guess, Jerome Avenue differently. Then there's a street, not so well known in Brooklyn, known as Quentin Avenue. Who is Quentin? Quentin was the son of President Theodore Roosevelt. And Quentin Roosevelt was killed in World War I. And subsequently, a street in Brooklyn, Quentin Road, was named for him. And last but not least, a really interesting story. And you can see the movie at some point, if you like, on YouTube. It has to do with a guy by the name of Sergeant Alvin York. Now, I'm not on the screen anymore, so you can't see the book I'm holding up. But, but um, this is a uh, volume that has the story of Sir, uh, Sergeant Alvin, Alvin C. York, Sergeant Alvin C. York, in his own words, which is quite interesting. You'll see why. So who was Sergeant York? Um, we'll finish off with another street name. If you happen to live in Manhattan, as I do, and if you live in the Upper East Side, there's York Avenue. York Avenue is a very long street um, on the Upper East Side, way over east, and uh, it's named for Sergeant York. Who was he? Amazing story. 
Sergeant York was born in a small, to put it mildly, really a hole in the wall, a small you know, town in Appalachia. And um, it's not even on the map. I mean, it's, it's just a small, um, I'm trying to think of the name of it again. It's in Tennessee. And um, it's called Pall Mall. Two were P-A-L-L-M-A-L-L, -L -L, like it used to be a cigarette brand. Anyway, Pall Mall, Tennessee is stuck in the, you know, in the, in the Appalachian Mountains or whatever. And um, very backward place, um, typical uh, population of what we call hillbillies, uh, literally. And you can see it in his own written account of the war, which you won't believe. I mean, it's, it's written exactly as you stereotype individuals that come from, you know, the backwoods and everything else. What happened was he, in the beginning of his life, rather desolate life, he was he drank, he gambled, whatever. But then he found religion and became a very, very religious young man. And World War I came around and they were recruiting everybody. And then he had a problem. What am I going to do? I can't kill anyone. It says in the Bible, thou shalt not kill. So he was in a quandary. And uh, he asked his minister what to do. And anyway, somehow or other, he managed to find a way to justify his participation in the U.S. Army in World War I and be sent overseas. In his earlier life in Tennessee, one of the things he developed was an incredible ability to shoot. Uh, that's how you get, that's how you eat, I guess, in these places. You have to be able to shoot wild turkeys and everything else. He was an incredible, incredible shot. He, he could use a rifle like no one on the face of the earth. And they sent him off to France. And, and um, there he served in the Meuse Argonne Offensive, one of the last offensives really of the war. But um, he achieved great fame when single handedly he held off an entire German unit of, I think, were 80 or 82 soldiers and a general. And he actually single handedly um, had them all come out with their hands up and, uh, and, um, and you know, give in to. Um, some, he wasn't Sergeant York yet, he had a lower rank, and, but he managed because of his abilities, even in the middle of all this thick machine gun fire and everything else, to basically stave off this um, approaching German uh, unit. For that, he became quite famous, and suddenly his name and picture were all over the place, and here he comes back to America, and he didn't know what hit him. I mean, his whole life had been in this little you know, a village really is somewhere in Tennessee where they were living still at least a century behind everybody else. He'd never seen the big city or never seen anything else. Now all of a sudden he's fighting in France and um, has the opportunity to see the rest of the world. So what happened um, with this transforming experience with Sergeant York? He was so moved and so taken by this experience. Why? He was in a unit of soldiers, for the most part, from the Lower East Side of Manhattan. So they were Jews, they were Greeks, they were Italians, and he'd never encountered anyone or anything other than his kinfolk back in Pell Mell, Tennessee. But he was by nature and his, by religious conviction a very humane and decent human being. And when he came back to America, he, he couldn't stand all of the attention he got. He was, first, he came back, there were all kinds of parades for him, and he was put up in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. He, he writes, he didn't even know which utensils to use when he ate at these dinners, because that's not the way they ate back in Pell Mell, Tennessee. But when he finally got back home to Tennessee and to his small town, um, the first thing he did is sought out his this young woman who had always wanted to be his wife and they didn't indeed get married and raise a family, but he used his fame and everything that followed again as a continuation of his experiences of the war. What did he do? He said, um, you know what? We folks back here in Tennessee, we have no real learning and you got to have learning. You got to be literate, right? And so he set up an institution to train and educate 
all of the inhabitants of all of the areas around that part of Tennessee. And he wrote, it's interesting, really. He said, and if there are any Jews and Greeks and Italian, they also get the free education. I want everyone to have the same opportunity. These guys were my buddies during the war and I'm not gonna forget them. And he saw many of them die. And um, then he set up other institutes for the pursuance of peaceful uh, resolutions of conflicts and so on. He dedicated his whole life really to this humanist uh, vision that he had. And so York Avenue in Manhattan is named for Sergeant Alvin Cullum York. And if you want to see a fascinating movie, it was made in 1942, starring Jimmy Stewart, who plays the role of Sergeant York. It's called Sergeant York. And you can find it on, on YouTube. And it's another great uh, view of World War I from another interesting perspective through the eyes of this young man who emerged from the, you know, the mountains of Tennessee and saw the world for the first time, but then came back with an image of greater importance, a counter to the death and destruction he saw in the war. He wanted to build something positive and enduring when he got back. And so he's the name behind York Avenue in Manhattan. Okay, I thought you might find that interesting. And um, we're gonna go on briefly with some more uh, issues regarding the weapons. We didn't talk about flamethrowers and so on, but then we're gonna move on to the Eastern Front and what happened in the war against Russia. And um, ultimately the Russian Revolution that came out of World War I. So if there are any questions, any questions, comments, this lecture like every other one is, is recorded at some point it will be posted so you have the opportunity to see it again if you like um, if i went too quickly perhaps um, you can view it a second time stay safe stay well and see you all again on actually next thursday i think because next tuesday is monday because monday is a holiday so it's actually a week till we see each other again Take care. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Take care. You too.